What we're going to be answering today, uh, first off, in the, part, the first part about vaccines and antibiotics is what are vaccinations and antibiotics and how do they differ? How do vaccines work? And what are the different types of vaccines that are used? As well as sort of the, the, the side effects and dangers of and safety of vaccines. Um, then finally, how do antibiotics work and what are their targets? Um, so at any time I give a lecture about antibiotics or about vaccines, I like to provide some resources um, that are quality about um, sort of these things because simply because there's so much misinformation out there about both of these two topics. So good places to go for information include the World Health Organization, CDC, UN, FDA, um, and so on and so forth. There's tons and tons of good information out there. Please stick to a .org or .gov um, site when you're looking for information about any of these things simply because um, there's again there's so much misinformation there about these things and it propagates simply by people not understanding what's going on behind the scene. But again, if you need any advice about vaccines, please go to a trusted and reputable source like our own CDC. Um, so let's start with a brief history of vaccines as a whole because they originated prior to the use of antibiotics. So in 1796, a British physician named Edward Jenner worked on uh, both smallpox and cowpox. So smallpox is a particularly deadly virus. It, is, it represents one of the biggest causes of mortality of humans throughout our entire history. It has killed hundreds of millions of individuals. Um, throughout human history. Uh, the virus itself is about 10,000 years old, so it arose about the same time as measles did, um, um, but it is caused by a virus. Um, it has approximately a 30% mortality rate, um, and in the 20th century alone, smallpox killed about 500 million people. Um, in the 1980s, we did eradicate it worldwide um, <clears throat> through the World Health Organization, as well as a very effective vaccine. <clears throat> So smallpox is something that only exists on this planet right now in the form of a few stocks that exist in some of the world's biggest powers. So vaccines have effectively eradicated this. Um, that being said, Edward Jenner did work on these um, smallpox, and he worked on a close relative of smallpox called cowpox. And so cowpox, um, he used it to understand how smallpox worked. And so cowpox were these series of uh, viral infection that occurred first on cows that then spread to humans, causing these little pustules to form on the udders and eventually the hands of cows. And as you will see, this is pretty much what smallpox looks like when it infects a human cell. But Edward Jenner did live in an agricultural community, and he was aware of this sort of this folklore surrounding um, milkmaids in his community that milkmaids never got smallpox. Um, one of the interesting things Jenner noted was that milkmaids would never um, get smallpox, but they would be susceptible to cowpox, which is a viral skin infection found on both cows and in humans. So one of the interesting things about smallpox and cowpox is they're a group of, of viruses called the orthopoxes. Um, Cowpox is very closely related to variola or smallpox, and there are two different forms of smallpox. Um, but generally speaking, um, we think of variola major being sort of the, uh, the most deadly form of smallpox as a whole. Um, but if you look at the smallpox and cowpox, um, they cause very similar symptoms. They cause these pustules to form um, all over the body, and they have a very similar progression of symptoms, at least um, outside. Um, smallpox progresses to be much more serious in terms of humans, um, but, but as sort of at their basic level, cowpox and smallpox have a very similar set of symptoms looking at the um, formation of pustules. So Jenner asked, um, based upon this high degree of similarity, as well as the fact that milkmaids never got smallpox, um, is there a relationship between these two viruses? And so he did this experiment. Um, sort of a classic uh, microbiology experiment where a microbiologist was doing something incredibly inappropriate. But what he did is he took a milkmaid that was infected with, with cowpox. Um, and then what he did was he cut open the little pustules that would form on his milkmaids. Um, and then he would inoculate them onto children. The children would then get the, the mild form of cowpox. Um, and eventually that was cowpox would clear. Cowpox had a 0% mortality rate. So you would, if you got infected with it, you would always be cleared. Then what Jenner would do is he would take a smallpox infection from a patient and then infect the little child with smallpox. And the good thing about this was that the child did not then get smallpox. So this is really sort of 
a terrible experiment, <laughs> if you think about it, um, but it did prove that getting a similar viral infection would make you then immune to um, smallpox. So the concept here is the body's immune system was trained to recognize the cowpox through infection, um, very much the way your body does with any pathogen. And because of how similar cow and smallpox were, um, it was able to recognize smallpox and then it make, essentially made the person immune to smallpox. So this is the very first case of vaccines being used using the, the, the viral um, infection of cowpox to make an individual immune to smallpox. So it's a really, really important development um, because as I mentioned, smallpox as a whole has killed hundreds of millions of people. Um, so this is sort of a big first step in showing, hey, we can potentially inoculate people against diseases. Um, Jenner was also living at a time where, you know, we were starting to move away from this concept that, you know, diseases were caused by, you know, mythical or supernatural forces or a deity um, and is moving towards like, hey, there's actually an underlying mechanism here. It's an organism causing it, not just some bad air or things like that. Um, but after Jenner developed his smallpox vaccine, there's been a wide sort of range of vaccines that have developed, been developed both to, to, both to bacterial and viral, as well as um, parasitic infections. And so Jenner was back in the 1700s. Um, about 100 years later, we had the first rabies vaccine. Um, and then things have sort of moved on from there. And we've been developing vaccines pretty regularly um, throughout history. Um, if you want to, this is a really nice timeline about sort of a pretty detailed look at vaccines. Um, this is the underlying paper for this. Um, please let me know if you can't access this. It's a really good read to sort of understand how vaccines have historically developed, but there's been a wide div diversity of vaccines developed, um, but what you also notice is that many vaccines have been improved. Um, so you can look at something like um, uh, our measles vaccine has been developed multiple times simply to improve it um, and to make it better and safer. So, um, but to understand how vaccines work, we need to understand adaptive immunity. Um, and so adaptive or acquired immunity essentially creates a memory after an initial response to a specific pathogen. Essentially, if you're exposed to a pathogen, your body will remember it through the production of very specific types of immune-related cells. Um, but thinking about vaccines, there are two goals. So we want to provide protection from the pathogen without actually getting the person exposed to the disease. That's very important, especially if you think of something like measles or smallpox. It is very, very deadly and very, very contagious. We don't want people to die to become immune or potentially die to become immune. And the other goal of the vaccines is to create a small, uh, strong immunity to a pathogen prior to exposure uh, by training the immune system against it. And basically we want to keep it so that people do not get this pathogen and then cannot spread. Um, I'm no immunologist, um, but basic adaptive immunity um, is all driven through your B cells. They're a type of lymphocyte or a white blood cell that makes antibodies. Um, B cells that have the correct receptor shape recognize a vaccine antigen and bind to it. And then these B cells are activated to produce clone of cells that have the same receptor. <clears throat> so the idea being is if we have some sort of um, B cell here and it binds to an antigen, there's a clonal, so in this case we have an actual binding, and there's clonal expansion or reproduction, and then we create <clears throat> um, memory B cells as well as um, 4C plasma cells, um, which basically have, are releasing the antigen out to attack the, the uh, pathogen of interest. Um, the B cells become either plasma cells that make antibodies or memory cells. The memory cells um, basically see the antigen again and will change into plasma cells and produce large numbers of specific antibodies. And the, um, the size and specificity and speed of this immune response um, is, will increase with a repeated exposure. So if you get exposed to the same virus over and over again, your response to it is much better. Um, in terms of how we can make a vaccine, we, how can, the question we can ask is how can we uh, expose a person to a pathogen without physically, um, uh, without physically them getting the disease? And so there are four ways to make a vaccine. So the most common one is an inactivated virus. And so these are, vir these are vaccines that contain inactivated but previously virulent microorganisms that have been destroyed with chemicals, heat, or radiation. This is how we make our polio vaccine, hepatitis A, and rabies. Basically, you take a virus and you treat it chemically to make it no longer harmful, or you basically kill it off. And that is then used as a vaccine 
Um, the idea being is you have this full version of this virus or bacteria and your body is being exposed to it and will thus produce antibodies against it. But again, it's activated so it physically cannot cause infection. Um, next up is our, our live attenuated vaccines. And so these contain live organisms. Um, the way these typically work is you create them by injecting them into a different host. Um, principally, we like to use chickens um, and their eggs. And so you, the idea being you inject, um, say, the measles vaccine um, into a chicken egg. It mutates while well inside the chicken egg, making it less deadly to humans. And then you use that live virus to essentially um, inoculate people with. And so once it's sort of um, attenuated or mutated by being exposed to a different host, it becomes less dangerous to us, less virulent or less um, able to um, cause disease. And so this is, um, this is how we make our MMR vaccine. So the measles, mumps, rubella vaccine. This is how we make the smallpox vaccine, or at least historically used to. Um, this is how we make yellow fever and typhus vaccines. Next up is toxoid, um, and so some organisms, um, include, uh, including some we're going to talk to today, like those that cause tetanus, botulism, and diphtheria, um, they produce exotoxins that ba basically attack and kill the host and make it easier for the bacteria to infect and invade um, your body. And so what we do is take those toxoids out of the bacteria, we modify them chemically or um, deactivate them some way, and then we use that in a vaccine. And then finally, we have what are called subunit vaccines, and subunit vaccines contain only a fragment of the infectious agent, typically like the protein coat of a virus or the cell wall of a bacteria, um, and basically, um, we basically use it as a way to expose your, bo your body to the pathogen. Um, these are very similar, these subunit ones are very similar to the inactivated ones, only the difference is the subunit are just a very specific part of the um, virus or bacteria. And so, for instance, hepatitis B, hepatitis B vaccine is composed of only the surface proteins of the virus um, as a whole, um, in particular because um, this is often, the subunit is oftentimes safer than the whole physical inactivated um, form. And so here's just a, sort of a nice little table summarizing some of the very common vaccines that we see. Many of us have probably already gotten um, throughout the years, um, including the MMR, which is typically required, and um, something you might get every year in influenza. And so for the vast majority of people, unless you're immune compromised or very, very old or very, very young, um, vaccines are extremely, extremely safe. Um, but that being said, um, ev like every medical treatment on this planet, there is side effects. And so with vaccines, the very common ones include local swelling and redness, as well as cold-like symptoms, you know, fevers, chills, headache, fatigue, and potentially muscle and joint pain, in particular around the site of injection. Um, these are about 5% of all people that get a vaccine, and they typically disappear within one week. So these are generally mild things, um, not much to be concerned about um, and not life-threatening. Um, there are much more rare um, side effects going on here, um, and they vary depending on the vaccine pretty dramatically. Um, and so this has a great, this resource from the World Health Organization down at the bottom here is a great resource to understand what are some of the side effects and um, issues associated with some of the vaccines. Um, and so um, these include infections, so getting potentially a contaminated vaccine or getting a, a local site infection, a rash or an allergic reaction to some component of the vaccine, or a high fever. Those are about one in 10,000 to one in 100,000, so still pretty rare. And then we have some more serious things, including encephalitis, which is swelling of the brain, seizures, and even death. Um, these are one in one million in rarer. Um, but I just wanted to highlight these because, you know, one of the important things to understanding any medical treatment or any vaccine or anything like that is understanding how things can go wrong. Um, but ultimately, unequivocally, around the world, every doctor <clears throat> says that vaccines are safe um, and vaccines are extremely, extremely effective. Um, but there has been a lot of stuff that um, has sort of caused some flack um, around vaccines, and this is particularly um, what vaccines contain in addition to sort of the viral or bacterial particles that we're interested in. And so these include things like adjuvants, and these help the vaccine work better. Um, these are typically aluminum hydroxide or paraffin oil, and the idea being is um, 
is that um, it helps the body mount an immune response. So if we add an adjuvant to say, um, in this case, the tetanus vaccine, um, and what it does is it allows our immune system to better respond to um, the tetanus um, microbe and mount a more effective immune response. Um, next up is actually preservatives. Um, and so these vaccines contain, you know, bits of food that are actually kind of tasty um, to bacteria so they can be bacterial particles, fungal particles, whatever. Um, and so we've developed preservatives um, and the best preservative we had was thimerosal and this is a mercury derivative, um, but it's not dangerous like um, say mercury you would find in tuna fish, which is methyl mercury. Thimerosal is ethyl mercury. It's in completely safe and it was used extremely effectively to kill inf bacteria and fungi because bacteria and fungi are particularly susceptible to mercury-based compounds. Um, that being said, we've moved away from that. We use typically like salts and sometimes antibiotics in our vaccines to keep them safe. Um, but we don't use, that being said, we only use thimerosal in the case of long-term flu vaccines, so the multi-course flu vaccines. Um, but these are, um, these are important, both the juvens and preservatives, to maintain our vaccines as well as keep them um, safe for our use, because you, sim you simply don't want to have your vaccine contaminated with a virus or a bacteria that can then go on to lead to a serious reaction. Um, that being said, I uh, will also note that one of the other things people have issues with is aluminum inside vaccines. Um, the amount of aluminum in vaccines is very, very low um, when it's added as a juvent. Um, but there are a number of vaccines, both for bacterial and viral diseases, um, and they range um, in terms of <clears throat> when you need them, some are required, some are really, really important, again, if you're, say, in the military, um, but some are only needed if you're, say, going to, say, a tropical place. Um, um, in addition, there are some other types of antiviral agents that we could potentially use to um, treat viral infections. Um, they're typically difficult to find because viruses typically use the host's own enzymes as we've talked about. Um, and there's really hard, it's really hard to sort of, um, because of how small viral genomes are, to find targets to essentially um, get rid of um, a virus. Um, but the vast majority of um, antiviral agents that we use typically inhibit viral attachment or dispersal. And so for instance, the influenza virus, um, um, it has a, um, <clears throat> there's a, um, a, a compound called amantadine that inhibits viral encoding, so essentially prevents the virus of entering into the host cell. Um, many of you might have heard of xanamivir uh, uh, and Tamiflu that blocks um, neuraman neuraminidase, which essentially prevents the release of mature viruses. And so there are other ways to control viruses, um, but the best way and the safest way is actually just with vaccines. Um, other antiviral agents include inhibition of viral DNA and RNA synthesis. Um, and so remember that viruses reproduce much faster than host cells, and, they inhib and by inhibiting their DNA synthesis will affect the virus more than the host. And so common antivirals include acyclovir, um, it's an analog of guanosine which is one of your um, DNA bases. And it basically what it does is it prevents the no 3OH terminants. So it prevents this from linking to anything else, which in turn blocks DNA synthesis. Um, and then we also have antiviral agents targeting RNA-directed RNA polymerases. This includes an antiviral called uh, ribavirin, um, which lowers the fidelity of, or the efficacy of viral RNA polymerase. Um, and so the idea being is it, <clears throat> won't allow viruses to make viable progeny. Um, there are a number of different uh, targets for our viruses in terms of antivirals. Um, because, of the, because of the difficulty in separating the virus from the host, um, <clears throat> developing a good antiviral target is a bit hard. Um, so as we talked about, the best way to do this is to simply stop attaching um, the uh, stop the virus from attaching to the host. And so that's a pretty virus specific thing. Um, we also want to keep the virus from encoding and we potentially want to inhibit viral um, RNA and DNA polymerases, but it can be particularly hard because remember how directly targeted and directly tied the viruses are to host. It becomes a difficult task to do. Um, so moving on, so moving on 
back to um, sort of the safety of vaccines. Um, there's a lot of, as I mentioned, a lot of misinformation that's going around about vaccines um, and stuff that's you know completely and unequivocally false about them. And this includes things like vaccines, vaccines causing autism. Um, this is simply not true. There's been study after study after study that have shown there's no link between vaccines and autism. This is just simply not true. Um, this is just, um, as our president would say, this is unequivocally fake news. Um, there's been, do does, like I said, dozens and dozens of studies that have shown this is not the case. Um, there's also information going out there that infant immune systems cannot handle many vaccines. That is also simply not true. Even if you, even if an infant got all 14 commonly given vaccines simultaneously, it would only take about 0.1% of a three month old immune system to process and handle all of them and produce uh, immunity. Um, and so this is just simply not true. You, you could give an infant as much vaccines as you want and your immune system is so amazing that it can handle all of them at the same time. Um, people also like to say that natural things and natural immunity is better. Um, that's not true. <laughs> natural things are, can be oftentimes way more dangerous than artificial things. Uh, but in particular, um, there's no difference between natural immunity as well as vaccine acquired immunity. Vaccines are just safer. You're better off getting a vaccine against measles instead of risking you know, a death of yourself or potentially death to someone else by spreading it. Um, the other thing is that vaccines contain unsafe toxins. And this, as you can tell by my smiley face, is just not really true. And so just to sort of talk a little bit about vaccine toxins, um, the common chemicals that vaccines do include, in, include aluminum, which is an adjuvant, uh, thimerosal, which historically speaking um, was a preservative, but again, it's not used very much. Uh, thimerosal, as I've mentioned, is a mercury derivative. It is ethyl mercury, not methyl mercury. And then finally, there is formaldehyde, which we use to kill and purify the microbes. Um, and uh, so those are the three common things. There are some other things, um, but those are the three most common things you'll find in a vaccine. Um, the important thing to remember here is aluminum is the third most abundant element on the earth. Um, humans and, and babies eat about 10 milligrams of, or, well, it depends. At minimum, we eat 10 milligrams of aluminum per day, um, simply because aluminum is almost in everything we eat. And it's not like a it's not like a, we're drinking it or you know getting it from our from like utensils or stuff like that. It simply is just found in every organism simply because of how abundant it is on the planet as a whole. Um, vaccines as a whole have less than four milligrams of aluminum per um, per dose of the vaccine. So we're getting an extremely small amount of aluminum. But even if you had a really high dose of aluminum, you would need grams and grams and grams to actually cause a meaningful effect on a human being, even an infant. Um, thimerosal has, again, it has ethyl mercury. It's something that's easily processed by the body. Um, this is in contrast to methyl mercury, which is many of you might have heard of what's in like say tuna fish or um, is the, and is also the toxic form of mercury. And so this is, if, if, if thimerosal was methyl mercury, it would, yes, this would be a very dangerous thing to have, but ethyl mercury as well as um, other types of mercury um, are really easy to process by your body. So it's not really something we're concerned of um, and then in addition, formaldehyde um, is, is pretty common in vaccines. Uh, it's not particularly very abundant um, because formaldehyde is used as a way to purify the microbe or purify the vaccine as a whole. Um, that being said, the average infant does have 50 times the amount of formaldehyde in their body from um, relative to what they get in a vaccine. And this is due because you produce formaldehyde pretty commonly through your own metabolism. So during your electron transport chain and glycolysis, you actually will produce formaldehyde as a byproduct. And so it's not, you're not getting a very much of formaldehyde in a vaccine relative to how much you're naturally producing in the background. So the bottom line to this is that vaccines have these toxins, but they're either in the right form or not concentrated enough to matter. So this is a case where concentration really does matter. Um, and sort of just to wrap up on some other sort of falsities about vaccines. Um, vaccines give you the disease you're trying to fight. That's very, very rare in the case of those live attenuated viruses. It's you know about one in five million chance that you can get measles from the measles vaccine. Um, people are also <clears throat> are saying that infections are, infections are very low, so we don't need to, um, you don't need virus, um, we don't need vaccines, um, and this is just simply not true. We need to build up. Um, we, do, we do know that infectious diseases are disappearing over time, but 
Um, it's just not the case. Um, we do know that infections are rising in terms of a cause of death and developing good and safe vaccines is really important for them. Uh, but more importantly, um, the vaccines tie directly to this concept of herd immunity. Many of you might have heard of this when they talk about COVID-19. Simply means herd immunity is if you can inv inoculate enough people with a vaccine or a disease, it basically prevents, creates a barrier that prevents spreading of this disease from person to person. And so this is really important because, um, you know, when you don't, if you don't vaccinate or you refuse to get a vaccine, um, it doesn't just affect you and your family, it affects, mostly affects the people around you. Because the people that don't vaccinate your children, very rarely do their children or themselves die from the disease. But it's generally speaking, they kill other people who are not directly involved with them. And then finally, um, there's this weird rumor going around that uh, vaccines have human fetal stem cells. Um, and that's just not true at all, um, not at all. I'm pretty sure that was a, a point derived to sort of rile up the, pro, uh, the pro-life crowd um, out there. But uh, they do, vaccines can be derived from human cell lines, but never from fetal cell, stem cell lines. And more importantly, those human cells are directly removed before you physically get the shot. So um, as you can sort of see, there is a lot of sort of um, things out there that People are saying about vaccines that are simply just not true. Um, and so I do, I would refer you back to the sort of the original slide I gave you about how we can physically um, use, uh, how we can physically get the best information about vaccines. And that's not going to be from a blog, that is not going to be from a Pinterest post, that's going to be from reputable scientists and medical doctors. But the bottom line for vaccines, they're safe, they're extremely, extremely effective. Um, and I've, if there was a vaccine for every disease on the planet, I would personally get all of them simply because it's just a way to keep myself as well as the people I love safe. So moving on, we're gonna talk now about antibiotics. <clears throat> and so antibiotics are a different class of, of, of um, treatment for bacterial infection. So the important thing to sort of start off by mentioning is that, that antibiotics only work on bacteria. So if you have the flu, antibiotics will not help you at all. The only thing that, back, that antibiotics work on are bacteria as well as some archaea, uh, though antibiotics show limited efficacy on archaea. And so successful antibiotics that we've deployed, and there are hundreds of them, are the ones that have selective toxicity, toxicity meaning that they kill the bacteria, but they're not dangerous to us or they have limited side effects when we take them. Um, it's also important to have very few side effects, aka low sensitivity. Um, and so for example, penicillin is something that's really effective because the bacteria is susceptible, um, but a very small proportion of people have a say an allergy or a sensitivity to penicillin. Um, but that being said, I'm sure you all maybe know someone or heard of someone that has a particularly nasty sensitivity to an antibiotic. Um, th and that being said, not all antibiotics need to kill bacteria to be effective. So there are two classes of bacteria, uh, of uh, antibiotics. They include bacterial cyto ones, which kill the target microbe, as well as bacteriostatic, which prevents the growth of microbes. And so what this looks like, um, if we have a bacteriostatic infection, so we have the total cell count, say in a culture, um, <clears throat> And then we have the viable cell count, and the viable cell count simply means the number of bacteria we can then reculture from this culture. Um, and so total cell count is determined by something like microscopy, and the viable cell count is determined by essentially counting colonies after you plate them out. Um, but ultimately, both of these, these antibiotics work by helping clear an infection, but they do it in very different ways. So a bacteriostatic antibiotic or compound essentially keeps the amount of bacteria the same, but it pre essentially prevents them from um, growing and expanding in meaningful amounts of uh, meaningful numbers. Um, bacterial cytal antibiotics or compounds, um, we have bacteria, the total cell count remains high. And again, this is determined by microscopy. However, the number of viable cells, as you can see, drops dramatically over time. So basically we're just killing off populations of bacteria. And this, and finally, <clears throat> and finally, this is in contrast to bacteriolytic antibiotics or compounds, and these are ones that will essentially cause the bacteria to burst open. Um, and what you'll see is that the total cell count increases and then decreases, and you also see the number of viable bacterial cells 
increases and then decreases. So three very different actions of how antimicrobial or anti uh, or antibiotics work in terms of being bacteriostatic, bactericidal, or bacteriolytic. Um, but canonically speaking, there are four mechanisms by which um, bacteria um, are attacked um, by antibiotics, and these include inhibition of cell wall synthesis, inhibition of DNA replication, protein synthesis inhibition, as well as um, tetrahydro tetrahydrofolic acid synthesis inhibition. So these are the four ways that typically these um, antibiotics work. And so we're going to talk about um, how they inhibit cell wall synthesis first by talking about penicillin. And so penicillin is one of the earliest marketed, marketed uh, antibiotics out there. This is credited with, with saving um, millions and millions of lives over the, its history, um, including during World War II and World War, uh, where this was particularly important on the battlefield. But um, penicillin is, it belongs to a group of antibiotics called the beta-lactams. And these antibiotics work by binding to the same molecule that is important um, to some molecule that is important to um, a, a bacterial function. And what they do is they actually bind to the proteins that cross-link the peptides and, and activate them. So what they do is they bind to these cross-links that tie together these NAG and NAM, um, uh, that bind the NAG and NAMs together vertically, causing the cell wall to essentially break apart. So it's particularly important. And as you remember, all bacteria have cell walls. So if you can inhibit the cell wall synthesis, it's a really good way to get rid of um, bacteria. Um, in contrast to penicillin, vancomycin, which many of you might have heard of, um, is a really powerful um, antibiotic. Um, but it also, like um, penicillin, inhibits cell wall synthesis. And so the idea being is that instead of binding to those proteins, it actually binds to the peptides themselves. So those NAG, it binds to those NAG and NAM particles directly, not worrying about the cross-linking that occurs. And it is really effective against um, gram-positive bacteria, um, simply because vancomycin is a really bulky um, compound itself. And so what it does is it essentially sort of works its way into the cell wall and inhibits the cell wall from fully forming. Um, in addition, we have um, quinolones, um, and so quinolones target microbial top, uh, toposomerases like DNA gyrase. And so if you remember what DNA gyrase does is it essentially um, wraps um, the double-stranded DNA around proteins and relaxes it. And so this, um, and so the idea being is that if we can inhibit these um, <clears throat> um, these gyrases, which bacteria have that we don't have, um, they won't allow the bacteria to sort of um, keep its DNA sort of packed tightly. And so the way these antibiotics, um, quinolines work, is they, they don't inhibit the physical action of the enzyme itself, but they rather they bind to the DNA, the DNA gyrates to the DNA. The idea being the complex can't get off when the cell is replicating, and thus the cell cannot replicate their genome. So it's a pretty handy way of doing this. And again, this is something that we do not have, but bacteria do. So it's a really effective way. Um, tetracyclines, um, which many of you may have taken or you may have heard of, but um, they're compounds that consist of four fused six, six, six membrane rings. <clears throat> and so the most common type of um, duct of, of, of um, tetracycline we have is either tetracycline, which, which is an antibiotic, or doxycycline, which is a pretty common thing. What um, tetracyclines in general do is they bind to the 30S ribosome, and so the 30S ribosome is the lower portion of the ribosome. What this does, um, if you remember back to how protein synthesis works, this what it does is it inhibits the A site, so the bacteria can, cannot physically add new tRNA molecules, which inhibits um, uh, protein synthesis as a whole. Um, that being said, this has been used pretty, um, <clears throat> pretty widely. It's used to treat things like Lyme disease, as well as acne. Um, and it's, it's many of these things simply don't, this in particular, many tetracyclines do not work on humans um, and affect humans um, simply because our ribosomes, our bottom of our ribosomes is actually different than a bacteria's. So it makes it more specific. Um, 
Next up is sulfa drugs. Um, many of you may have heard of sulfa drugs before. These are actually the very first type of antibiotic ever used prior to penicillin. <clears throat> and so these, back, these antibiotics work by inhibiting um, the production of folic acid, which is essential uh, cofactor in the pathway that makes nucleotides. And so the idea being in diagram B, you can see here, this is a complete folic acid molecule is being made. Um, however, you can see that um, <clears throat> what ends up happening is its core is made out of this, um, this compound called, called para-aminobenzoic acid, or PABA for short. And what you can see is when you add, um, say, a sulfa antibiotic, um, in this case, we're adding sulfanilamide. Um, and what we can see is happen is that this SFA, the sulfa antibiotic, essentially replaces PABA, meaning that folic acid can no longer be synthesized. Um, <clears throat> and the idea being is that you need um, folic acid um, to make um, amino acids as well as nucleotides. And so if you can inhibit the production of folic acid, you can essentially limit um, how much um, in the activity of these bacteria. And so antibiotics, as I'm sure you may have heard before, they have a wide spectrum of activity, and this varies. And so there are some uh, bacteria, some antibiotics that are broad spectrum, such as tetracyclines, which affect many different species and types of bacteria. Um, and then there's much more sort of specialized types of antibiotics um, that, affect, that only impact one type of um, bacteria, say a gram negative or a gram positive or um, <clears throat> or even something like, uh, even within a category, say the psyllins, um, there's many, uh, anti many antibiotics within the psyllins that will only affect gram positive or only affect gram negative. Um, but broad spectrum, as I mentioned, are effective against many species, whereas negative, whereas narrow spectrum are against very few species. And so there are a number of um, antibiotics out there um, and they have sort of a wide, and this, this is a really nice table illustrating how different types of antibiotics, different spectrum antibiotics can affect, um, are affected um, by many, can affect many different types of bacteria, whether they be anaerobic or aerobic. Um, in terms of lab work, um, broad spectrum antibiotics are good um, if you're in terms of if you don't have time to test for the type of bacteria that are present. So say if you present to the clinic and you have an infection on your skin, um, the first thing they typically do is give you a broad spectrum antibiotic until they can physically test uh, a, t a test to see what you have, um, because one of the downs, uh, one of the side effects of broad spectrum antibiotics is that it affects your host microbiome as well, and that's not something that's very good. And so, broad spectrums are used until they can narrow down what pathogen is affecting you as a whole. And so, they figure out how to um, determine dosage by determining what is called the min minimum inhibitory concentration, or the MIC for short. The idea being is they take an antibiotic in a culture and they dilute, they dilute the antibiotic to different amounts. So what you'll notice here is that we have these different tubes and you can see the, the right half, I'm sorry, the left half here is very turbid indicating bacterial growth, whereas the right half here has <clears throat> very little bacteria or no bacterial growth. And what you'll, what you'll notice is as we move from left to right, we're seeing that the concentration of an antibiotic is increasing. And so by determining the lowest concentration with no growth, this is the minimum inhibitory concentration, or MIC. Um, this might still leave, um, this might still leave um, some living bacteria, but um, it, it pre essentially prevents major growth of these bacteria. And so what we can see here for, oops, for this minimum inhibitory concentration here, there's no or little growth. And so our minimum concentration would be one microgram per milliliter. And ultimately, we're, we're seeing if we produce any viable colonies at the end to determine this. Um, in terms of, this is just sort of a nice summary figure to show you some common antibiotics and how they're affecting um, different parts of the bacteria, whether they're protein inhibitors, um, RNA elongation proteins, DNA gyrase inhibitors, cell wall synthesis, or folic acid inhibitors. And so um, the most common type of antibiotics will again fall into these cell wall synthesis simply because this is something that bacteria have and we do not have. Um, but ribosomal inhibitors are also pretty common um, specifically because our ribosomes are so different than bacteria's. <clears throat> 
So just to summarize the first part, vaccines and antibiotics both target pathogens, but do so in very, very different ways. Vaccines use your own immunity to kill the pathogens, whereas antibiotics either directly kill the pathogen or inhibit the pathogen directly. <clears throat> Vaccines are essentially training the immune system by exposing a human or an individual or an animal to their uh, pathogen or a part of a pathogen, or, and so it allows the adaptive immunity to remember the pathogen and make the, the individual immune um, over a long period of time. Um, vaccines are really effective. They can impart immunity within hours to days after exposure, um, but, and they can also generate lifelong lasting immunity. So in the case of our MMR vaccine, that's something you get very early on in life and it will last you to the day you die, which is nice. Um, antibiotics are essentially compounds that we use to inhibit the growth or kill off bacteria, and they affect the, the target by inhibiting some sort of necessary process in the bacterial life cycle, in particular cell wall synthesis and protein synthesis. So next up, we're going to talk about antibiotic resistance. So it's sort of the dark side <clears throat> of these antibiotics. And so the questions we're going to try to answer in this lecture are what causes a microbe to be resistant to an antibiotic and how do they develop or acquire these traits? What are the mechanisms by which bacteria prevents the efficacy of an antibiotic compound? And why do we have lots of antibiotic resistant microbes? Um, and so we're just going to have a quick, before we dive into antibiotic and antibiotic resistance, we're just going to talk about this concept of antiseptics and disinfectants versus antibiotics. Um, I'm sure you all <clears throat> are well aware of the, the mad grab for antiseptics and disinfectants. And uh, I figured we'd just clarify how they are different from antibiotics, um, as well as how they are similar to antibiotics, because very much like antibiotics, bacteria can require, acquire exist, resistance to an antiseptic or a disinfectant. Um, all three of these are chemicals that kill or inhibit the growth of microbes. Um, antiseptics and disinfectant modes, disinfectants modes of action are very, very broad. And so they typically, if you think of something like Lysol or bleach, they denature proteins, they disrupt cell membranes, and they damage DNA. Um, and you might notice that some of those actions are very similar to antibiotics. Um, but that being said, um, most of these antiseptics and disinfectants are simply too toxic for internal use. They don't have that selectivity toxin that very much like um, antibiotics um, do. Um, <clears throat> um, that being said, um, this is why you should not ingest or drink an antiseptic itself um, or a disinfectant simply because they are, they, not only would they kill the bacteria, but they'd also be extremely toxic to you. So, you know, don't be like the people you hear on the news drinking bleach or drinking alcohol or drinking Lysol. That's just not um, good. However, if you want to use an antiseptic or a disinfectant on your skin, that would be okay. Um, in addition, we also can see, um, in addition to antibiotic resistance, we can see vaccine resistance. And so as we talked about, with HIV viruses in particular, um, retrovirus can evolve extremely quickly. Um, in particular, because the pro the polymerase that makes um, uh, <clears throat> that makes proteins for viruses or um, um, transcribes the uh, viral genome um, is very, very inaccurate. Remember, it can induce multiple mutations in a very rapid period of time, as we talked about with HIV in last class. Um, in addition, sometimes two different viruses or two viruses that are slightly different can infect the same cell and can fuse their genomes together, potentially dramatically changing them. Um, so that being said, the antibodies that your body produces in response to a vaccine are very, very specific. So mutations that dramatically change the surface of a virus or part of the genome of a virus can render a vaccine obsolete. So we see this every year with the flu vaccine. There are new strains every year and vaccines from previous years simply are not effective against new strains simply because of the mutations as well as multiple viruses recombining to form sort of a novel virus. And so um, we can have resistance to vaccines, but luckily many of the really nasty vaccines uh, and diseases out there like say the MMR vaccine, typically, um, I'm sorry, not typically, we have never seen this happen. Um, but it does make developing some vaccines a little bit difficult. Um, and so people have been trying to work on an HIV vaccine for 20 years now. Um, and, people, and some people make uh, the sort of comment that um, it will be impossible simply because of how fast HIV falls. As I showed you, um, within a single population of HIV viruses, within a single host, there's an extremely high level of genetic diversity. Um, and remember, this is simply due to how fast 
HIV replicates, um, and it has an extremely high mutation rate. Remember, it's one in every 30,000 DNA bases that a, this, this virus makes um, will have a um, mutation. And the idea being is if an HIV genome has 9,700 nucleotides, there's one, there's one mutation for every 30 viral genomes produced. So it is extremely common, which makes resistance um, or something or the capacity to develop an HIV vaccine a very, very difficult prospect. But as we talked about, it would be an incredibly important and incredibly life-saving vaccine if it could be developed simply because of how pandemic um, HIV is. Um, and it, I will also mention that this is one of the things that sort of makes it a bit difficult to develop a vaccine for COVID-19 because we don't know quite about, don't know quite a much quite as much about it as we do other pathogens, simply because it's a novel virus. And so there might be some issues with vaccine resistance that may develop as a whole, but we're not quite sure yet. So keep your eyes uh, peeled in the next 18 or so months and uh, we'll see what, what, uh, what develops with this. And so next we're gonna move on to antibiotic resistance after sort of those two little side effects. Um, and I like this little comment. Uh, I have this you know, sort of shady superbug. He's like, hey kid, want to be a superbug? Stick some of this into your genome. Even penicillin won't be able to harm you. Um, <clears throat> and it was actually kind of, it's actually sort of a, a pretty accurate way that things work is that you have this bacteria sort of unassumingly moving through a system and it's picking up some antibiotic resistance from some other microbe. But um, as many of you may have heard, um, antibiotic resistance is a huge, huge problem right now. Um, and so the World Health Organization um, last year set, set, this, um, set this statement out and they said, antimicrobial resistance is a serious threat that is no longer a prediction for the future. It's happening right now in every region of the world and has the potential to affect anyone of any age in any country. So just put this in perspective, last year in the United States, we had 2 million plus people infected with antibiotic resistant bacteria annually. And of those 2 million, 23,000 people died as a direct result. And so that's a pretty effectus, that's a what one in 100 chance of dying if you get infected with the antibiotic resistant bacteria. That's not good. 1% is not good. And so this is only projected to get worse. And so these are projections from the uh, World Health Organization for 2050. And these are, you know, we have different um, common types of deaths, whether it's tetanus, road traffic accidents, measles, um, some form of diarrhea, this could be Vibrio, could be anything, diabetes, and then cancer. What you'll notice is that antimicrobial resistance is projected to kill about 10 million people annually. So this is not just a problem that's gonna be a huge problem in the future, it's also a big problem now. There are hundreds of thousands of infections, even just in the Boston area with antibiotic resistant microbes. And so um, the problem here um, is that any therapeutic agent has the potential for the bacteria to develop resistance or tolerance. Remember that bacteria grow fast, they adapt quickly. And so this is true for both um, bacteria, but it's also true for fungal, parasitic, and viral infections as well. And so the potential for any um, immunity to a potential antibiotic or vaccine um, begins the very first time the antibiotic is used clinically or potentially even in the environment before that. And so for instance, the first enzymes to tackle penicillin, so they're called penicillinases, were discovered in 1940. Um, this was two years before penicillin was deployed to the public. Um, <clears throat> And so, but ultimately given enough exposure and time, target bacteria will become resistant to any antibiotic. And so I'm sure you all remember these from last year, that 10 year challenge. Well, 10 year challenge for my antimicrobial resistance um, looks a little bit like this, where we have these, um, these inhibition rings for these common antibiotics here, but we see that there's no inhibition rings here. And so this is something that just sort of builds over time. And so there is a pretty consistent pattern of, of antibiotic resistance that develops over time. And so what you'll notice here is we have antibiotics the year that they were developed and the year resistance was observed clinically. Um, just because it's observed clinically doesn't mean the resistance didn't exist previously. Um, there is um, a huge reservoir of antibiotic resistance out there in nature, in particular in soil where these, um, <clears throat> where these bacteria are, uh, are producing lots and lots of antibiotics to be more competitive. Uh, but what you notice is that antibiotic resistance evolves quickly. So penicillin, it took three years. Um, chloramphenicol, which is a really powerful antibiotic against gram-positive bacteria, took about 10 years. 
Um, one of the more powerful antibiotics we've seen, vancomycin and methicillin, took about one year, or in the case of vancomycin, about 22, I'm sorry, 32 years. Um, but you can even see some not some <clears throat> modern antibiotics we're seeing um, with daptomycin, again, a really powerful antibiotic, took only two years to see clinical resistance. And so this is something that can affect, can um, essentially happen extremely quickly um, in the environment, but can spread rapidly in a clinical setting. <clears throat> and so just to put this in perspective, if we look at streptococcus pneumoniae, um, we see that 80% of all strep pneumonia infections are penicillin resistant in the vast majority of countries. So what you'll see is this is the, this is, um, the, the 1960s and 40s where there's no percentage of, of um, strep pneumonia having resistance. By the time we see resistance evolve in 1979, there's a very small amount. But you'll see that in the 2000s, we're seeing upwards of 60 to 80% um, resistance in many countries, including um, Korea and Japan. So um, ultimately, we're thinking about this antibiotic resistance. It happens fast. It spreads through populations particularly quickly, and it does, and it does simply arise due to the use and overuse and the improper use of antibiotics. And when I say improper use, I, it's typically meaning that people who don't finish their course of antibiotics. So if you don't learn anything else from today's lecture about antibiotic resistances, use all your antibiotics when you get them because if you don't, you potentially could be more rapidly spreading antibiotic resistance through the population. Um, that being said, there, um, <clears throat> we can ask the question, uh, what makes bacteria resistant or become resistant? And so the first sort of line of evidence we should look at is extrin intrinsic resistance. And so it's the ability for bacteria to resist the action of antibiotic as a result of inherent or inherent structural or functional characteristics. Um, and the idea being is if the bacteria has, is, has, is missing um, a susceptible target for a specific antibiotic um, or, the, or the bacteria has the inability for the antibiotic to enter the cell itself, or they have the capacity to remove the antibiotic with a pump of some sort. And so we can think of <clears throat> some particular antibiotic that say can make it through the outer membrane, but it physically can't disrupt the cell wall. We can think of antibiotic um, potentially that simply cannot bind, oops, simply they cannot bind or enter the cell as a whole. Or we could think of an antibiotic that might be able to make it through the bacteria, but is then pumped out by some sort of pump. And so <clears throat> just some examples of how this works. Um, if you have the, the uh, absence of the susceptible target, for instance, tri uh, triclos triclosan targets the enzyme enola ACP reductase. Um, and What's interesting is that taxa from the genus Pseudomonas, which is a really common bacteria, um, not only globally, but it's also something we've used in lab, and it's a really important clinical pathogen. They carry an uh, insensitive allele or a variant of the gene for this gene, which basically means that trilocycan is unable to bind to this variant. Um, it also has the other common example of an oops, the intrinsic example is the inability to reach targets. So for, in particular, vancomycin inhibits peptidoglycan cross-linking. And in gram-negative organisms, vancomycin simply cannot cross the outer membrane to reach the target peptides, thereby making gram-negative bacteria immune naturally or intrinsically to vancomycin. Um, <clears throat> and so intrinsic back resistance is important, but it's typically well-defined, and it means it's therefore predictable. Um, and so ultimately what makes resistance truly threatening is the ability of bacteria to acquire or develop novel resistance to antibiotics. And this is, and when we're thinking about acquisition, it's through horizontal gene transfer. And when we're thinking about development, we're thinking about um, mutations to the genetic structure of the bacteria. And so ultimately resistance um, does stem from the genetic diversity of microbes. And so as we've talked about multiple times, microbes are incredibly diverse genetically. And there are multiple uh, mechanisms of bacterial genetic diversity um, that occur. And so it can have microevolutionary change where there's, you know, thinking about point mutations that occur within a genome. Um, we can have macroevolutionary change, which include rearrangements of large segments of DNA in a given in a single event, or the acquisition of foreign DNA via plasmids, phages, or transposable genetic elements, or remember direct uptake from the environment. So these are the three common ways we're seeing um, mutations and changes inside a bacterial genome. Um, but ultimately, we can ask the question, what makes a bacteria become resistant 
or naturally resistant. And so <clears throat> antibiotic resistance is typically mediated by several mechanisms that fall into these three main categories. So first is those that arose, um, those that minimize the intracellular concentrations, um, particularly thinking about poor penetration into the bacterium or a pump to remove the, the antibiotic from the cell. <clears throat> Second is those that modify the antibiotic target, so some sort of genetic mutation or post-translational modification of the target. So basically um, doing something to the antibiotic to make it less toxic or completely inactive in it. And then finally, there's also those that in inactivate the antibiotic directly. And so this is some sort of chemical reaction. Um, that being said, there is some bacteria that are naturally <clears throat> um, resistant to antibiotics um, because they eat antibiotics. Um, and they use it as a food source. And so if, if you didn't think antibiotic resistance was scary enough, there are bacteria that will physically um, eat your antibiotics. Um, luckily, we do not find them on humans. They're only found in soils. But um, just to sort of add up another line of how bacteria become resistant because they get hungry. So let's talk about mechanism one by minimizing the antibiotic concentration. Um, so remember, to be therapeutic, an antibiotic needs to enter the cell and reach a sufficiently high concentration to be effective. Remember, this is how we talk, how we think about the minimum inhibitory concentration. And so when we think about this, this is how we inform how we dose a human. Um, and the, typically the doses, dosage of any antibiotic is based upon the size of the human. So someone like me, who is larger than all of you, is much higher. So they can have reduced permeability overall. Um, next up is efflux, the idea being we can pump antibiotics out of the cell, and this is mediated by channels called efflux pumps. Um, most efflux pumps have a pretty broad specificity. They, they can pump multiple different types of things in and out of the cell that are useful to the bacteria, and this makes them highly, highly efficient. And so this can actually help them contribute to multi-drug resistance because these pumps can pump multiple different types of antibiotics at once. Um, <clears throat> rep, uh, these pumps represent a greater threat when coupled with low permeability cell envelopes. Um, and in particular, this is um, true for our gram-negative bacteria as well as mycobacteria simply because of the extra membrane or extra uh, capsule that they have on their surface. And so we can talk about tetracycline resistance real briefly. Uh, first, so for tetracycline to work, it must enter the cell cytoplasm and accumulate to concentration that is sufficient to allow it to bind to the ribosome. Um, a bacterial strategy that prevents antibiotics from reaching high enough concentration in the cytoplasm is to pump the antibiotic out of the cytoplasm as it is taken up. This is done by protein pumps called efflux pumps that remove the antibiotic. Um, to concern, um, the concern about these pumps is that they are often not specific to a single antibiotic. And so the pump will, will recognize multiple types of antibiotics and remove them from the cell. This is another way that bacteria can become multi-drug resistant. So this is what we see with tetracycline. If this happens, it affects the ribosome, there, thereby the antibiotic will work. If this happens where we're pumping things in and out, the, the ribosome is not inhibited, the bacteria is not killed. Remember, because even if the, the antibiotic can make it in, you have to have a high enough concentration to physically just uh, uh, be detrimental to the bacteria in some shape or form. Um, so mechanism two is protecting the target molecules. And so remember, antibiotics have a particularly high <clears throat> affinity or specificity for their target molecules. Um, 
And so can, they can generate resistance by producing targets different enough to avoid binding. And so much like how a minute change in, in surface antigen can thwart our immune system, as we talked about with viruses. Um, this can be achieved via genetic mutation or post-translational modification of a target mo molecule. And so target modification occurs when a gene homolog is a uh, gene homologous to the original target, but is insensitive to the antibiotic. This is typically a result of mutations. And so the idea being is if we have um, a target uh, antibiotic, it comes into the cell and it targets some sort of molecule. If there's some sort of mutant allele, this will make the molecule slightly differently shaped so the antibiotic will no longer then work. Um, <clears throat> resistant variants of the D can also be a product of DNA recombination. This is termed mosaic genes. And so for instance, uh, this is the way um, methicillin resistance has arisen in Staphylococcus aureus or MRSA. Um, methicillin resistance is conferred by the acquisition of the MEK-A gene, and MEK-A codes a beta-lactam insensitive, um, insensitive protein of PBP2A, um, and this protein enables uh, cell wall biosynthesis to occur despite having the native PBP be inhibited by the presence of the antibiotic. So it allows um, this, this bacteria to essentially continue to build its cell wall even though methicillin is there to inhibit it, which is, uh, which is scary because MRSA is one of the sort of the, the uh, most commonly and one of the most deadly antibiotic resistance. Um, another way that this happens is by target protection and the idea being you can add a chemical group to the target to prevent it to be bound by the antibiotic. Um, the idea being is um, this, after we synthesize a molecule of interest after translation, so making a protein, we, ch we add, we do something like methylate it, so add a methyl group or phosphorylate it, um, which um, simply prevents the antibiotic from essentially binding and targeting that thing of interest. Um, it doesn't require a mutational change in the target. It is simply um, something that um, just the bacteria can do um, intrinsically. <clears throat> Um, and it typically works by blocking the binding site, as with most things in chemistry. If it can't bind, it can't be effective. And so antibiotic resistance um, <clears throat> in terms of vancomycin, um, and so I've, as we mentioned, vancomycin is a really powerful antibiotic. Um, um, what ends up happening is with a vancomycin resistance is they modify their target. So when a bacteria is susceptible to vancomycin, they're affected by binding to 2D alanines inside at the end of a NAM molecule inside the cell wall. By this happening, this doesn't allow the last dialanine to be cleaved, and thus there can't be any cross-linking that can occur. So remember, the antibiotics, uh, the cell wall bacteria needs that cross-linking to keep it together. Um, <clears throat> And so vancomycin has multiple genes that are involved in its resistance, but the first, VanH, what it does is it converts pyruvate to D-lactate, and this, this lactate is then substituted into the cell wall and the NAM peptide, um, so that instead of two D-alanines, we have, um, we have NAM, we have, um, I'm sorry, uh, D-alanine and D-lactate instead. Um, <clears throat> The the um, the <clears throat> the third uh, the next enzyme that is important here is Van A or Van B, which leads to the formation of the D-alanine D-lactate bond here. The final enzyme that's important is Van X, and this what this does is gets rid of the D-alanine D-alanine peptides by cleaving them. So this also prevents um, vancomycin from binding because it can't stick to a single D-alanine. And so this is the way vancomycin resistance works. And like I said earlier, the modification of the target is the same way bacteria become resistant to other drugs like such as quinolones and sulfa drugs. Um, next up is target protection. And so the antibiotic um, erythromycin acts to prevent protein synthesis by binding to bacterial ribosomes. And so the, <clears throat> the erythromycin ribosome methylates or ERM family of genes, um, they, what they do is methylate ribosomal RNA and alter the drug binding. So they typically modify that small subunit of the ribosome. Um, quinolones, aka ciproflaxin, they prevent DNA synthesis by targeting um, top, top, top osomerase and DNA gyrase. And so there's genes called the QNR genes. Um, they, they include a, <clears throat> a repeat of proteins, which 
bind and protect the tosomerase and DNA gyrase from the lethal actions of quinones, and they can release the quinolones bound to tosomerases, thereby rescuing the protein and saving the protein. Um, and this is found in numerous pathogens, and including E. coli. Um, next up is, is mechanism three, which we're going to inactivate the antibiotic. And so thousands of enzymes have been identified that can degrade and modify antibiotics of different classes. Um, these, include, these include enzymes include beta-lactamase, penicillinase, carbapenemases, acetyltransferases, and phosphotransferases. The idea being is if you could produce something that can degrade the antibiotic, you can get rid of it, make it less toxic. And so we can also modify antibiotics in addition. So this causes the antibiotic resistance by preventing the antibiotic from binding to its target as a result of steric inhibition. Remember, for an antibiotic to work, it needs to physically have the structure to bind to. And so there are, very, there are many, many different types of chemicals that can be transferred onto an antibiotic that will then prevent it from binding. So the idea being we can add acetyl groups, phosphate groups, nucleotidal and ribotidal groups um, that essentially modify the structure of an antibiotic, making it unable to physically bind to its target of interest. And these are a pretty diverse group of, of enzymes that cause modifications to antibiotic resistance. Um, and so one of the <clears throat> uh, one of the antibiotics that was is really powerful, um, but it is also has a pretty high degree of toxicity is chloramphenicol. Um, and so chloramphenicol is a was is a pretty common um, antibiotic we used to treat gram positive. Um, bacterial infections, but it's a really toxic one, so it's only used in rare cases. But chloramphenicol is an antibiotic that targets um, it, uh, and inhibits protein synthesis. This works by this antibiotic works by sticking to the 50s or the small subunit of the I'm sorry, the large subunit of the ribosome. And um, bacteria become resistant to chloramphenicol by, by, by not modifying the ribosome itself, by adding, but instead by adding a group of acetyl group, by adding a set of acetyl groups to the antibiotic itself. And what this does is it blocks, what it does is it blocks um, the antibiotic from binding to the ribosome, um, thus making it so the ribosome can still work. Um, a common way that, that um, bacteria will um, modify their <clears throat> um, antibiotics is by hydrolysis, the idea being they're preventing activity by destroying the antibiotic. And so this a really common way this happens is by um, beta-lactamases, in particular penicillinase is what we're going to focus on. And so what it does, it inactivates the beta-lactam antibiotics by hydrolyzing the beta-lactam ring structure. So this is what a normal sort of penicillin or a psyllin class of antibiotics would look like. It has this beta-lactam ring, which is really important for the structural response of beta-lactam. And what, but what, what these beta-lactamases do is they essentially cleave this off, they hydrolyze the bond, um, removing that ring structure and changing the shape. And remember, the shape of these antibiotics is really, really important overall. Um, and again, if you can change the shape um, dramatically or even minorly, you can have some pretty um, major um, um, drug resistance that can develop. Um, Multi-drug resistance is something where bacteria accumulates many genes or mutations um, or acquires many genes to <clears throat> essentially um, allow a bacteria to be resistant to multiple different strains of antibiotics. And so the most notorious strain of, or most notorious type of bacteria that we know of is actually MRSA. So uh, it's multi-drug resistant Staphylococcus aureus, formerly just known as methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus, as we've talked about. Um, and so we also know that there's been a recent emergence of pan-resistant gram-negative strains. These include bacteria like Pseudomonas aeruginoser and Acinetobacter baumi. Um, and the idea being is they have outer membrane barrier, uh, have an outer membrane barrier that has very low permeability, an array of very efficient multi-drug efflux pumps um, that allow them to be resistant to multiple different strains of these bacteria. Um, the idea being is if you're multi-resistant or multi-drug resistant, it allows you, it basically limits the amount of drugs you could potentially use to treat them. Because oftentimes when you get a very serious infection like MRSA or a Pseudomonas or an Acinetobacter infection, it's a, they try to use multiple drugs to treat these uh, bacterial infections. <clears throat> 
And so um, this is just a nice summary table of how, um, of what uh, some different antibiotic classes we have, an example, as well as the target and the mode of resistance. It's a really handy thing to sort of, um, sort of summarize what we've seen thus far. Um, but we can observe, and as we've talked about, we can observe um, antibiotic resistance in action. And uh, since this is a recorded lecture, I'm not going to play the video, but down here at the bottom, there's a very nice link um, to the BAME lab at Harvard Medical School. They have this really fascinating experiment that they developed called the Megaplate. Um, and what they do is they look at the um, accumulation of antibiotic resistance in E. coli on this huge plate. So they have this 60 centimeter by 120 centimeter agar plate. So this really monstrous plate. Remember, this is about five feet long and about you know three feet wide. What they do is they put agar on top where the bacteria can move, and this agar has different concentrations of antibiotic in them. And what they do is just let the E. coli grow, and it will move after it's inoculated from one side, it will move in towards the center. And as they move in towards the center, the concentration of antibiotics gets higher and higher and higher. And so you can physically see the evolution of antibiotic resistance develop over time. And so we can see, um, you know, zero hours from inoculation here, and after about 260 hours, you'll see that that the antibiotic, that the bacteria is moving into extremely high concentrations, 3,000 times the minim inhibitory, minimum inhibitory um, concentration of this antibiotic, in a very short amount of time, only 264 hours. And you can also notice that there are a number of mutations that occur and a number of different lineages that arise during this. Um, this is sort of a, a not very um, <clears throat> great explanation of it, but I do suggest you watch the video I linked on the previous slide. It is a really fascinating thing to see um, in real time. And so the next question we can ask is, is why is resistance so common? We've talked about how the World Health Organization considers antibiotic resistance to be one of the most dangerous threats as humanity is facing, making things like routine surgeries potentially life-threatening. Um, this is up there in terms of deadliness, um, in terms of global things up there with climate change. This is the number two most dangerous thing we are currently facing after climate change. But um, antibiotic resistance is really common because we've, we've used a lot of antibiotics inappropriately um, and we've used them to try to treat viral illnesses and they simply just don't work. Um, another common issue is we use antibiotics to increase the uh, biomass or the mass of our livestock. It has this weird effect um, where it increases the, the, uh, the weight of cows, um, and we're not sure why, but it does make a breeding ground for antibiotic resistance via horizontal gene transfer. Um, the excessive use of antimicrobial preparations and soaps and cleaning solutions in non-healthcare facilities, so thinking about you know, what you buy from the store. Um, we also have the increases in the number of immunocompromised patients, thinking of things like HIV or other um, immunological disorders, um, which requires prolonged courses of antibiotics. And the longer you expose the bacteria to an antibiotic, the more likely they are to acquire resistance. Um, international travel does promote the move movement of resistant bacteria from areas where it never existed before. And then finally, poverty does lead to inadequate antibiotic use because of the expensive use of adequate therapy. Because remember, as I mentioned, it is really important to take your entire course of antibiotics. Um, and if you simply cannot afford the full course, um, taking a partial course can be one of the ways that antibiotic resistance arises. So just to summarize the second part, antibiotic resistance in bacteria, aka superbugs, are a huge threat to global health. And while some bacteria are inherently resistant to certain antibiotics, they can also develop or acquire resistance. The mechanism, mechanism of resistance fall into these three strategies. So limiting the concentrations in the cell, producing insensitive targets, um, or inactivating the antibiotic itself. Um, and most bacteria that are drug resistant employ a multitude of these mechanisms converting resistance to all those different types of antibiotics. And so <clears throat> when we talk about bacteria in the class, we typically talk about um, uh, bacteria as a whole, um, but one of the sort of the the original way bacteria came to providence was thinking about their role in disease. And so in this section, we're going to talk about disease. So how do we recognize different types of microbial pathogens? What are the different mechanisms of microbial attachment and secretion of toxins into the host cell? And what methods do pathogens employ to survive a host immune response? And so this is the dark side of microbiology. 
So when I talk about microbes, I talk about them lovingly, how much, how important they are to your everyday life. But there is that dark side of microbes. And so anytime you pool a group of people, this is the one, this is the one thing they always say microbes do. They cause disease, they kill people. And this is the one, this, this is where most of microbiology, all the cool new stuff we learn is occurs. And so uh, I just want to keep in mind as we talk about bacteria and disease, and many of you I know do not like microbes, but keep in mind that human pathogens account for a very small fraction, less than 1% of the total number of microbial species on the planet. Um, and that being said, many pathogens are actually bacteria that live on you normally, and something bad happens to you, like your immune system, or you get a wound that causes them to become infectious. And so, for instance, Staphylococcus aureus, which we've talked about a few times in this lecture, is a normal component of your nasal microbiome, as well as other parts of your skin. So pathogenic bacteria can be good bacteria, um, given the right situation. Um, so infectious diseases as a whole account for about 29 of the, of the 96 major causes of human morbidity and mortality. It causes 25% of global deaths, so that's about 16 million deaths annually. So it's a lot of, of, of issues here. Um, so the number of cases of many infectious diseases, such as tuberculosis and cholera, are currently increasing, and many diseases are emerging or re-emerging. And so you can think of something... Um, <clears throat> Uh, we're thinking about the population, the number of chlamydial infections has been increasing um, every year. The number of measles infections is increasing every year. We do know that pathogens are increasing their abundance every year. And we're going to talk about how these things spread, uh, how these things spread um, later in the semester when we talk about um, <clears throat> um, um, epidemiology. And so pathogen is actually derived from the Greek word for producers of suffering. Um, it's a blanket term for any organism that causes disease or in any infectious agent. Basically, you have to cause harm to the host. So as we know, as far as we know right now, there are about 1,400 species of infectious organisms that are known to be pathogenic to humans. There are, I'm sure there are many more that are known to be pathogenic to animals and other organisms as a whole. Um, this includes, of those 1,400, there are 217 infectious viruses and prions. So prions are sort of like viruses. They're not living, but they're infectious proteins. Um, they have no DNA. They're just proteins that have gone bad and cause infections. Um, prions disease are things like mad cow, Crestville yakov disease, and Kuru um, disease. There are 538 bacteria in rickettsia. Rickettsia are, are intercellular parasites, so they're a bit different than a regular bacterial pathogen. There are 307 pathogenic fungi, 66 infectious protozoa, and 287 uh, infectious helminths, which are parasitic worms such as tapeworms, ringworms, or if you have a dog, a heartworm. Um, so pathogens, again, have five different types, bacteria, viruses, fungi, protozoa, and worms. Um, we, we've pretty much been focusing just on the bacteria in this course, as well as a little bit on viruses. Um, so we'll start off by talking about bacterial pathogens. So these are our germs. There are currently 538 recognized taxa that are infectious. Um, other than viruses, um, which we typically consider to be um, probably the most common type of infectious disease. These are um, typically the baddies we hear about, including uh, strep throat, MRSA, E. coli from, if you like, Chipotle, um, cholera, um, shellfish poisoning, so Vibrio perihemolyticus, uh, tuberculosis, the Black Plague, and the list goes on and on and on. There's no shortage of fascinating pathogens, and I should say deadly pathogens out there as well. So what we're gonna talk about is how do these infections happen? And so there's um, a couple of routes. So we have horizontal transmission. So a simple versus um, uh, simple, which is a direct transmission, as well as a complex, which involves intermediates. And so formites um, are one of the common ways things are, are transmitted. These are inanimate objects like your computer, um, your phone, the handle on the subway. Um, and that's in contrast to vectors that include animals, which um, typically we're thinking, for animal vectors, we're thinking about mosquitoes mostly. Um, in addition, we can have vertical transmission from parent to child. Um, and these, um, the access is typically gained either through the gut, the respiratory tract, um, and typically your mucosal membranes in some way, shape, or form. 
Um, but infections do have multiple cycles. Um, the idea being you can be exposed to the pathogen, it adheres to your skin or your mucosa, it invades and it colonizes and grow. And so one of the things it does, it's either produces some toxins that either affect the local skin and of the local tissue and damage it, or it spreads it throughout your body, or they can potentially invade in your body and spread throughout your body. Um, both of the invasiveness and as well as colonization can allow you to be further exposed at other sites. And so um, <clears throat> as a, sort of a pathogen grows, it makes it more likely that it's going to expose you further, it also makes it more likely that it's going to spread to another individual. Um, and ultimately, we're talking about these feedback loops that are occurring here where one thing happens and it causes increased exposure. And so there are uh, several components to microbial pathogenicity systems, including attachment, toxin, secre secretion systems. Um, and these are our slides at the end. Um, we're not going to dive deep into them because... Uh, I'm going to have to restart the slide over because I had, a, I had to take a quick um, family emergency um, while I recording this. But there are four components of microbial pathogenicity systems. Attachment, the production of toxins, um, secretion systems. Um, these are going to be slides at the end simply because their um, secretion systems are a really in-depth topic um, that you're free to take a peek at yourself, but it's sort of beyond the scope of things, um, what, you're, what we're interested in. And then finally, uh, immune avoidance. <clears throat> And so in this picture, what we have is actually lactobacillus, which is a bacteria it's expressing a structure, in this case, an antigen from a, di um, from a different pathogen that is being engulfed by a dendritic cell. And so the digestion of these bacterium by the dendritic cell releases the antigen and the dendritic cell itself can then activate other aspects of the immune system. So that's actually pretty cool to see in real time. Um, in terms of adhesins, there are any microbial factor that it promotes attachment to any surface. In particular, we're thinking about um, <clears throat> uh, attachment to cells. And so viruses have their capsid or envelope proteins that allow them to attach. Um, bacteria have a variety of strategies to bind to specific host receptors. Um, in particular, uh, the most important mechanism are actually these little structures, these little knob-like structures, which are called pili. Um, these allow for static attachment, and there are two different types. So there is type 1 pili and type 4 pili um, that are involved. Um, but attachment, um, as we'll talk about when we talk about biofilm formation, attachment is very, very specific. Um, it does require a high degree of specificity and affinity um, between the component of the bacterial surface and a component of the host cell membrane. So even if you get infected with a pathogenic bacteria that say only affects cows, it might not physically be able to affect you simply because it doesn't, like a virus doesn't have the, quite the right uh, machinery. Uh, and so pathogens themselves have evolved multiple um, <clears throat> Uh, targets, um, multiple systems to target specific hosts, and sometimes different cell types within a similar host. So for instance, for example, um, Bacillus pertussis, I'm sorry, um, Bortadella pertussis, or the whooping cough, has developed some particularly um, specific antigens to bind an attack on your um, mucosal membranes in your lungs. And so here's are some the four sort of major categories of binding um, that we typically see. So we have capsules or slime layers, adherence proteins, lipotechoic acid, which facilitates binding to walls, as well as pili. And so Bordetella pertussis is the causative agent of whooping cough. It does cause and colonize the ciliated proportion of your mu uh, respiratory mucosa. Uh, fun fact, um, there is, you typically get um, a vaccine for this when you're a child. However, I actually contracted whooping cough before I got it, before I got the, um, the vaccine. Um, clearly, I did not die because I'm still alive, but whooping cough can actually be pretty dangerous. Um, but as I mentioned, it does call, colonize the ciliated respiratory mucosa. And it's a surface actually specifically designed to or something that looks very similar to glucose that, are, that occurs on ciliated cells of our um, mucosal membranes in our respiratory system. Interestingly, mutations in this FHH gene allow reduce the capacity of this bacteria to colonize. And actually, one of the interesting things is that the host antibodies against FHA provide protection against infection. 
And so what we can see is that um, uh, what happens is we have a normal ciliary movement. What happens with um, <clears throat> Um, happens is uh, pertussis will bind to these, preventing them from movement. So the, and what ends up happening is that these, this pertussis produces this pertussis toxin that causes the host levels of this compound called CAMP to increase, which leads to the disruption of normal host cell functions, including the protective beating of the cilia. Because normally these beat from side to side, they move. It helps protect your, your uh, respiratory system from getting um, infections like this. Um, the other thing that it does is it increases, prevents certain immune responses such as chemotaxis, um, bacterial engulfment, and bacterial cytal killing. So it, it suppresses your immune system at the same time. And one of the things that's uh, sort of characteristic of whooping cough is sort of this mm -hmm, mm -hmm, like gasping. Your your body's sort of trying to break apart these sort of um, uh, these barriers and these bonds that are forming to try to get the cilia moving back and forth. So it's a pretty interesting pathogen. But again, this is something we have a, a vaccine against, um, but some people get it before um, the vaccine is there. So, um, after a bacteria is attached, the pathogen needs to physically colonize and grow. And for it to do that, it needs to survive. And so there are many, many mechanisms for that a bacteria can survive in the host. Um, one of the most common ways um, <clears throat> is causing apoptosis or programmed cell death of macrophages, which will typically engulf and eat the bacteria. The bacteria can also resist, uh, secrete thick capsules. This is what we see actually in Streptococcus pneumonia, uh, as well as Neisseria meningitis, the causative agent, as you'd imagine, of meningitis. Um, and what they do is they secrete these thick capsules that prevent um, drying out. It also prevents um, uh, phagocytes from attacking. It also prevents the penetration of antibiotics. They also will make proteins that bind to antibodies. And so for instance, Staph aureus, um, creates, um, has a protein A in its cell wall. What it does is it binds to antibodies inside the host, hiding it from phagocytes. So it's kind of interesting because the way it does this is it binds them upside down, which actually prevents your, your own immune system from recognizing Staph aureus. So if you didn't think Staph aureus was already a jerk because of how, <laughs> um, of how infectious it is because of its antibiotic resistance, this is another way that it is kind of a jerk. Um, and then in addition, the sort of the final thing they can do is actually alter the surface antigens periodically. So they, they do this thing called phase variation where they change the outer proteins on their cell, making them harder to detect by your immune system. Um, so one of the important things they need to do is survive macrophages. And so these are a component of your white blood cells or your immune system that um, essentially engulf and, and ingest uh, pathogens and toxic things. The idea being is if you have a microbe or a particle, they're engulfed by the plasma membrane of your phagocytite. The phagocytites then bind these um, vesicles containing these microbes to a lysosome. And the lysosome then, as if you remember back from your very original science course, the lysosome releases enzymes and acids to dissolve things. And then once things are dissolved and inactivated, they are then secreted as waste. Um, one of the interesting things is some pathogens, such as uh, Shigella, which causes dysentery, as well as Listeria monocytogens, um, what they will do is they'll produce a, a protein called hemolysin to break out of these phagocytes. So they basically do a mini jailbreak. Um, some phagosomes does... Um, um, some phagosomes, um, when they're sort of releasing chemicals and, and acidics, compounds into the uh, lysosome. Some pathogens actually secrete proteins to, pre to prevent this fusion of the, the vesicle that they're in to the lysosome. These include bacteria like salmonella, chlamydia, um, tuberculosis, as well as Legionnaire's disease. And then finally, some pathogens become activated in an acidic solution. So there's a bacteria co called Coxellia ornetti. It causes Q fever. Um, and uh, what it does is it, it once it is exposed to the acidicness, it does, doesn't actually destroy or harm the bacteria. The bacteria actually becomes more pathogenic. So it's kind of like a, you know, haha, -ha to your immune system. Um, <clears throat> but there are multiple alternative fates to intercellular pathogens. And so they can be clearly digested um, by your phagocytes. But once they make it inside you, um, some will tolerate that phagocytic um, fusion, others prevent it from happening, and others are able to escape the pathogen um, and replicate in the cytoplasm of your cell. So if we have a bacteria that invades your cells, it potentially can invade 
the lysosome or escape the lysosome or potentially break out and move from cell to cell, allowing it to invade your immune system. So next up, we, we, need, we need to sort of figure out what makes pathogens different because plenty of microbes have the capacity to grow and colonize on our bodies and evade immune responses. And this sort of um, is directly tied to your sort of your own skin microbiome and your own bodily microbiome. Remember that microbes are an incredibly important part of your um, overall functioning of your body. So there's lots of microbes that have the capacity to colonize and evade your immune system, but what makes a pathogen different from your host microbiome. Um, the key here is that they cause harm, whereas your host microbiome does not cause harm. And so doing damage is what makes something pathogenic. You, do, you can't die from a pathogen unless it damages your body in an irreplaceable manner. And so pathogens cause harm by absorbing nutrients, damaging tissues as part of their infection. So for instance, Helicobacter pylori is uh, what causes ulcers and it burrows into the epithelial tissue on your stomach, causing damage, eventually leading to your own stomach to develop ulcers or holes within your stomach. As you can imagine, if you have a hole in your stomach, that's not particularly good for you. Um, in contrast, we have Streptococcus mutans erodes the enamel on your teeth as it breaks down sugars and lowers the plaque pH. Um, but the main way in which pathogens, um, at least the coolest ones, because um, you know we're all about talking about cool things here, is actually through the production of toxins. And so there are two different types of toxins, endo and exotoxins. Exotoxins, I'm sorry, endotoxins are lipopolys are lipopolysaccharides. They're an integral part of the cellular outer membrane and gram-negative bacteria, and they are released upon cell lysis or cell death. This is in contrast to exotoxins. These are things that are actively secreted by the cell, but are also released upon death of the cell. And they can be very potent and lead to host cell and uh, death and lysis. So let's first talk about endotoxins. These can be um, <clears throat> hyperactive. Um, they can lead to hyperactive immune systems that are essentially harmful. And so the most common type of, of, of as we mentioned, endotoxins is lipopolysaccharide. This is something that's found on all host, uh, all gram-negative bacteria. It's something that's important for their cellular structure. It comes with three parts, the O antigen, the outer core, the inner core, and the lipid A. And the idea being is upon cell lysis of the bacteria, whether it's through a phagocytite or through di direct destruction by any part of the immune system, the lipid A is released into the host. It binds to uh, what are called toll-like receptors in your immune cells. And what this does is it activates monocytes, dendritic sites, macrophages, and B cells, um, which causes inflammation, fever, release of cytokines, and reactive oxidant species, as well as nitric oxide, um, the latter two, which are particularly dangerous to you as a, hum as a human. But ultimately what this does, it leads to major tissue organ damage by the production of all these different things. Um, and it's simply by releasing of, <clears throat> of lipid A from the cellular membrane of the bacteria. Um, it does, again, mounts a, a rapid immune response, which can lead to septic shock and death. And so the best case of this is actually um, Neisseria meningitis, which causes, which is an infection of your meninges, which is the blood brain barrier in your skull. And by, as you can imagine, there's not very much room up in your head. And so if you cause inflammation, as well as reaction, reactive oxygen species is, and other dangerous things, um, it could potentially lead to some pretty severe, severe brain damage as a whole. But ultimately, these, um, these uh, lipopolysaccharides cause pretty systemic damage as well as local damage. Um, so we think about fever being produced, it's sort of a, a systemic thing. And inflammation can be both local and systemic as well. In contrast, we have exotoxins, and these are things that directly kill the host cells to unlock the nutrients. So basically, these bacteria are inside you to kill your cells and eat your cells because your cells are tasty to them. Um, and so there's a couple different types. We have type one, and these bind to the cell surface and mess with the signaling pathways that occur within your cells. And so <clears throat> these are commonly uh, studied as super antigens. They bind to T cells and cause massive T cell activation and a nonspecific immune response. This causes lots of inflammation and cytokine release. Um, and the best study case of these are actually in Staph aureus and Strep pyrogens, which cause what are called toxic shock syndrome the idea we have an overstimulation of your immune system here. Type two is membrane damaging, so hemolysin, and so these create channels or pores in the cells, on the host cell membrane, and they lead 
they cause a leaking of ions in water, which can lead to cell lysis. And so um, <clears throat> in lab, we looked at hemolysis, uh, different types of hemolysis. This is an example of type two exotoxin. And then finally, we can have type three, which are intercellular ones. These are commonly known as A, B toxins, A for active and B for binding. The idea being is the B unit binds to the host and the A unit, A subunit enters the cell causing damage. So there are a number of um, exotoxins out there and there are nine classes that disrupt. So there's ones that, that disrupt plasma membranes, the cytosol skeleton of your cells, ribosomal activity, cellular division, signaling pathways, cell to cell adherence, the formation of vesicles, exotitosis by your phagocytes, as well as immune system regulation. So there's a whole host of things that affect your cells. Um, but I'd like to just take a moment to talk about AB toxins. The, so as we mentioned, the B subunit binds to the host cell and the A delivers, then it delivers the A subunit into the cell. So this is what they look like. They sort of look like a flower, um, except for they're much more deadly. The A subunit has pretty toxic activity. So for instance, it can inhibit, inhibit enzymes that are important for the production of ATP. Um, and the two best study examples of this are actually the cholera toxin as well as the diphtheria toxin. Um, ADP ribosylating toxins, um, what they do is they add ADP ribose to a protein, which can change the activity of the target protein, basically taking charge of your cells and what your proteins that normally do things in your cells uh, and changing their activity. And so one of the most common ways we know of this is actually through the cholera toxin. So what it does is it um, overactivates um, an enzyme called adenylate cyclase, which makes tons of this factor called cyclic AMP. And what this does is it activates water flow. Um, I'm sorry, it activates ion transfer, which allows water to flow in and out of your cell, which causes your cells to potentially swell and rupture. Um, this is what leads to the uncontrollable diarrhea and potentially the death of the human um, if you are infected with cholera. Um, diphtheria um, actually does something very similar, but what it does is it actually just completely blocks ribosome function, which if you cannot use your ribosomes, your cell will eventually die. And so this is just sort of three examples in Staph aureus, dysentery, and E. coli of how these AB toxins work and how they look with. Um, in addition to sort of some of these, we have a special class called enterotoxins, um, which are exotoxins that are marked by the effect upon gastro uh, effect on the gastrointestinal tract. So these typically are things that are, are, are causing diarrhea and food poisoning in people that are exposed to them. And so and the idea being is that uh, frequently these, these enterotoxins are cytotoxic and they simply directly kill cells by um, altering their their outside membrane permeability, as well as the mucosal membrane of your intestinal wall. And so they start as these pore forming toxins um, and that are secreted by the bacteria that assemble and form pores in the cell membranes, causing your cells to die. Because remember, if your cells don't have an intact membrane, they can't maintain homeostasis, well then allow, which will let them to die. The idea being this also increases the chloride permeability, which leads to the leakage into the, into the lumen of your, of your bowels, followed by a sodium water movement, which is where you get the diarrhea from after, you, uh, after a few hours of ingesting one of these um, enterotoxins. And these are pretty common in foodborne pathogens, including cholera, E. coli, as well as um, our friend here, Staph aureus. Um, and so directly tied to sort of these production of these toxins and their capacity for these bacteria to invade your body and survive in your body is this concept of virulence. And so virulence um, is sort of this uh, three-way uh, three road between pathogenicity, infectivity, and virulence. So pathogenicity is the ability of a microbe to be pathogen or cause damage. This is something that is qualitative, i.e. we're just looking at it and say, oh, this is a pretty pathogenic bacteria. Um, that it, it, the idea being is something is or something is not pathogenic. There's no degrees, and it's not something you can physically measure. Um, this is in contrast to infectivity, which is the capacity of a microbe to cause an infection. This is something that's quantitative, is something you can actually measure in an effective infectious dose. And an infectious dose is simply the amount of bacteria um, that is required to colonize um, an experimental host. So for instance, uh, for you to get E. coli poisoning in your gut, you only need a few hundred E. coli. That would be the uh, infectious dose for E. coli. In contrast, something like cholera, you need hundreds of millions of cholera to get cholera infection. 
And then finally, virulence is the relative capacity of a microbe to cause damage, i.e. the strain A is more virulent to strain B. It is still quantitated and is measured by what we call a lethal dose. And a lethal dose is um, <clears throat> Uh, the idea being that in this example, uh, strain, uh, strain 1, here strain A, is more virulent than strain B. But the lethal dose is how much is physically required to cause um, mortality in the individual that's affected. And so we can measure virulence um, <clears throat> um, by um, exposing a group of animals or, or subjects to increasing amounts of the pathogen and absorbing the effects. And the infectious dose, remember, is the number of organisms needed to colonize experimental hosts. In this case, it's 50%, whereas the lethal dose is typically measured as what we call the LD50, the number of microbes needed to kill half of the animals. And so what we can look at is this is the dose and the number of organisms administered per animal and the mortality. And so we can see the LD50, or the lethal dose, here is about 400 and the lethal dose here is about 600 and so this is agent one and agent two but what you will also notice here that the um <clears throat> the low the thing you want to take away is that the lower this ld50 the more virulent this this organism is um, and there are a number of things that contribute to the virulence of organisms. There are features or molecules that are produced by the pathogen that increase their efficacy as pathogen. So they contribute to colonization of the host, including attachment, evasion of the, the host immune system, suppressing the host immune system, and easy entry in and out of cells, and obtaining nutrients from the host. So there's a number of ways these bacteria can be more virulent to the host. Uh, we've already talked about many of these things already, um, including the enzymes used in escape strategies, exotoxin, but there are many, many more um, ways that a bacteria can be virulent. And people also consider antibiotic resistance to also be one way to determine whether a bacteria is virulent. Um, oftentimes, um, virulence factors are regulated by quorum sensing, which we'll talk about next class. Um, um, but quorum, just as a note, quorum sensing is how bacteria communicate with one another through the production of um, chemical molecules. Um, and so we, can, we know that, for example, that Vibrio cholera has an escape machinery where it will turn it on in the presence of a host, or Pseudomonas will turn on its virulence genes. And so these systems are extremely diverse as a whole, uh, but there is one particular um, aspect of uh, of um, host virulence that's called pathogenicity islands. And so genes that make bacteria more virulence are, can be typically found on what are called pathogenicity islands. These are on the bacterial chromosome, they can be on a plasmid, or they can be found in phage, phages. Um, what's sort of interesting is they typically have a very high GC content, so many, many more guanosines and cytosines that make up their DNA, their genome composition, and they're often flanked by a phage or plasmid genes. And what these do is they encode uh, virulence factors that include toxins, attachment proteins, um, capsules. They can also contain antibiotic resistance genes as well. Um, and these can also be horizontally acquired through, again, through viruses or through direct um, transmission from one bacteria to another through, say, conjugation. Um, in addition, uh, we've been talking sort of about primary pathogens. These are things that cause um, direct disease, and that's pretty much all they do in relative to us. But sometimes normal microbiota can become pathogens, and they can result from the host becoming immune compromised, having a damage um, in the normal microbiome, or an injury in itself, like a cut. So some classic examples is a deep cut. So just to put this in perspective, we've been talking about Staph aureus. It loves to live on your salty skin. It likes to be in your nose. Um, but with a cut, it can be introduced into your bloodstream where it can then colonize, form biofilms, and become virulent. And so opportunistic pathogens are very, very common. Um, studies suggest that diseases like um, dermatitis, psoriasis, rosacea, acne are often caused not because of a pathogen, but simply due to the disruption of your normal microbiome. And one bacteria in particular um, that we're going to discuss, uh, or one group of bacteria that we're going to discuss, is actually Clostridium. And so Clostridium are a group of bacteria that live normally inside your gut. Um, but however, they've been gaining a sort of a, a pretty... Um, a pretty uh, heavy dose of research in recent years because of how important they're becoming um, in terms of pathogens to humans. And so they are gram-positive bacteria, they're obligately anaerobic, and they do form endospores. 
and they are rod shaped. This is what they look like with their little endospores. There are firmicutes. So um, we've looked, we've worked with um, firmicutes in the lab before. Um, Bacillus subtilis and Bacillus megatarium come from this group of firmicutes. Um, and the firmicutes are a pretty diverse group, and there are about 100 known species of Clostridia right now. And Clostridium contains several pathogens, um, so Clostridium difficile. Um, many of you might have heard this as C. diff infections, really nasty gut infections. Um, Clostridium perfringens, it causes food poisoning, fasciitis, and gas gangrene. Um, Clostridium tetani, which causes tetanus, and then Clostridium botulinum, which causes botulism. This is also the bacteria where they get the, the, the toxin that we use in Botox to make women's faces, and I guess men's faces too, you know, rigid because it causes paralysis of the nerves. Um, and so this is just a picture showing you what people with tetanus get. They get that sort of arching effect due to the constriction of their muscles through these bacterial toxins attacking their nervous system. The clostridium is, again, it's a normal piece of your gut flora, but it produces some really interesting things. So for instance, clostridium tetani, which causes tetanus, produces a, a exotoxin called tet, uh, tetanospasmin. It's a neurotoxin. It blocks um, inhibitory impulses by interfering with the release of neurotransmitters in your nervous system. The idea being if there's a release, a diminished inhibition, the rest of um, the firing rate of your motor neurons increases, producing rigidity and unimposed muscle contraction and spasm. And so <clears throat> these can be particularly deadly. Um, so tetanic uh, spasms can be sufficiently severe to fracture long bones. Um, in, con uh, in sort of in line with this is Clostridium botulinum, which causes botulism to toxin, which many of you know as a, um, <clears throat> is a foodborne pathogen. So if you go to the grocery store and you see a engorged can, um, sort of a bloated looking can, it's likely infected with Clostridium botulinum. But what its toxin does, botulism, um, which again, we do use in the, in the, the medical treatment Botox, it blocks neurotransmitters um, causing muscle paralysis. And this is a really, really deadly toxin. Um, a single bacteria within a 24 hour period can produce enough toxin to kill the entire world. And as little as three grams of botulism could kill all of the United Kingdom. And so the United Kingdom has about 67 million people. And if we had 400 grams of the toxin, which a bacteria could produce within, within not a very long period of time, could actually kill the entire planet or all 7.4 billion of us. Um, but as I mentioned, it is used medically to prevent um, spasms. Um, but is also cosmetically as Botox. So we're hijacking this bacteria's toxin to make us look um, pretty and help with spasm. Okay, and just to wrap up this lecture, um, just to summarize what we talked about in part three. So pathogens are agents that cause harm, and while they are a small fraction of microbes, they're important clinically. They, remember, they kill millions of people every year, um, and they're only, their importance to us is only expected to grow as over time, as antibiotic resistance becomes more and more of a problem. Um, infection is a multi-step process that involves the inherence growth, host immune evasion, as well as toxic secretion. Um, and the toxin secretion part is typically the part that causes harm and tissue damage that can potentially lead to organ failures and eventually death. Um, bacteria do produce a wide range of toxins, including endo and exotoxins. And these toxins do differ in their mechanism of action, target, and resulting effects. Um, and as we talked about, um, tetanus and botulism can be particularly deadly pathogens. And it's something you definitely do not want to get. Um, so with that, that'll be the end of the lecture. There is some information here at the back about secretion systems. Um, and I suggest if this, any of this interests you, you take a peek at secretion systems, both what, what I have here, as well as sort of um, digging around in the internet. Um, but please remember, if you have any questions, please let me know. I'd be more than happy to answer them. Um, and with that, I hope you all have, um, have a good day.